We are rightfully calling this the policymakers challenge because no matter where you look in the world, whether it's in the developed or developing countries, uh, COVID-19 has uh, sent the global economy into a tailspin. Uh, we've seen declines of anywhere from five to 10% in GDP, uh, with the exception of some of the major developing countries that hopped onto the COVID-19 crisis very early. But what does it mean for the manufacturing sector diversification in the different economies. We have an expert panel of policymakers joining us here at the GMIS, uh, representing Russia in Eastern Europe, uh, Bangladesh in South Asia, and Rwanda in Africa, of course. Let's formally introduce those uh, panelists that are joining us now. Uh, Mr. Arkady Vorkovich is the chairman of the Skokovo Foundation uh, in Moscow and the former deputy prime minister and somebody I've had the pleasure of interviewing in the past. Uh, His Excellency, uh, Nurel Majid Mahmoud uh, Humuyant, who is the, the Minister of Industries uh, of, of Bangladesh, and Her Excellency Soraya uh, Hakuzema Remye, who's uh, speaking on behalf of the President of Rwanda, uh, His Excellency Paul Kagame. Welcome all of you to the GMIS. And I'd like to start, and I think it's apropos today, with Mr. Brokovich uh, joining us from uh, Russia. I, I saw today that the RDIF uh, was suggesting uh, in the liaison with the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, that they'd like to see the vaccine, the Sputnik V, uh, fast track to see if we can get it onto the market in, in rapid uh, succession here. How important is your view, Mr. Rakovich, to get the development of this vaccine, not only in Russia, and the second one is in the pipeline, but the other countries around the world in terms of the context of restarting manufacturing, oh. restarting innovation in your view? Thank you for this question, uh, and um, uh, I'd like to say good morning to uh, everyone, uh, or uh, good afternoon uh, in some countries. Uh, uh, I think the development of the new vaccine against uh, COVID-19 is uh, really critical uh, to stabilize uh, the global economy, and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, certainly uh, the best thing to to develop many of those. uh, we don't know which one will be the most effective and the safest one yet. Uh, we believe that uh, the vaccine that has been developed in Russia uh, recently is a safe one. We will see the, uh, um, its efficiency over the next few months, uh, but the preliminary estimates uh, and evaluation is that it is uh, efficient. Uh, and uh, the faster it will go to the markets, uh, to the countries, and uh, uh, we really hope that it's not going to cost anything to, to people, uh, that uh, governments will actually uh, pay uh, for that. Um, uh, the faster the um, recovery of the economy is going to, uh, to happen. Vaccines is not, not the only thing uh, to do. Uh, the uh, medical treatment, the uh, drugs, the medicines for the treatment uh, are equally important. Uh, and we already have, have some in Russia. We know that there are some in other countries uh, as well. And uh, this will also help to fight uh, this, uh, um, this disease uh, that uh, created the crisis in the global economy. Uh, so uh, we are very flexible regarding uh, uh, using our vaccine all around the world. Uh, and uh, we are open uh, to, to see uh, the, uh, the next uh, uh, discoveries and next development. Thank you very much for being candid and and that question here. There's an argument, uh, of course, I can have a quick follow-up with you, Mr. Brokovich, that not just Russia, but many countries are trying to rush to get this out. Does this kind of outweigh this concept in the manufacturing world that you have to live with COVID-19 for probably six to nine months? Is that the reality, despite the developments we see in Russia and other countries, Mr. Brokovich? Yeah, I think it's still the reality, <clears throat> and uh, it's not going to, to be like overnight solution for uh, everything. The manufacturing se- sector will still suffer from, uh, uh, from the crisis, uh, and uh, only this time the uh, real situation. Uh, but uh, the development of vaccines gives hope that it will uh, uh, end uh, uh, in a relatively reasonable time frame rather than uh, uh, go all until the end of 2021. Mr. Vokovic, thanks for your candor. Let me bring in uh, Mr. Humuyan from uh, Bangladesh. I I know there's been a package put forward for stimulus for the manufacturing sector. You're well known for your textile industry. How has that stimulus helped buffer against COVID-19 and then the ability to foster other sectors in the future? Thank you very much. It's very important. You know, 
globally, especially Bangladesh, the RNG sector, garments manufacturing, we are one of the leading countries. And for COVID-19, during these months, we have suffered a lot, especially in our export and manufacturing sector. So you know it, our government, especially our prime minister, Sheikh Hasina, daughter of Bangabandhu, the founding father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, we have taken very timely decision for this, you know, this biggest sector, RMG sector, which is one of the biggest in international our in supply chain, which has very much disrupted our economic growth here. We have taken some challenges and we have given, government has taken so many packages so that it continues. You know, our prime minister has given, they will have to live and with the COVID and fight out it. We cannot stop everything. All manufacturing units, you know, by this time, we have already opened and they are working on our banks and financial institutions under the direction of our prime minister and our this government, they have started now full phases so that we can continue in this recession, so new life, and we can continue our international supply ahead and the international market. That's our challenge we're facing, and every day we are improving. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I appreciate that. Let's bring in Minister Sreya from um, Rwanda here. I know you've launched uh, way back in 2000, and we've had a chance to talk about it before, particularly your role here in uh, trade and industry, uh, the special industrialized zones here uh, in the year 2000 to get rapid industry into place. How would you uh, classify the setback, if you will, Minister, uh, of COVID-19? Is it really hurt the development as a result, or is it a blip that lasts for 12 to 18 months? What can we see from uh, at this juncture, Surya? Um, thank you very much, John, and, and good morning to everyone on the, my fellow panelists. And I want to thank, first of all, the UAE Ministry of, of Energy and Industry and the United Nations uh, uh, Industrial uh, Development Organizations for, for this uh, opportunity to speak about you know, progress of manufacturing and challenges uh, during the pandemic. As you mentioned rightly, John, um, Rwanda had already embarked on um, uh, and the industrialization uh, program, especially uh, since the launch of the Made in Rwanda policy in 2015, uh, to make sure that we could develop um, our own local manufacturing uh, capacity uh, and also build a sort of resilient economy by reducing our trade deficit and imports. Of course, this unprecedented uh, global pandemic has come with its challenges. Uh, and, and for Rwanda, which is a landlocked country, uh, the, the supply chain disruption uh, means that our uh, manufacturing industry has seen uh, its transport costs go high, uh, access mm. to raw materials uh, disrupted. Uh, but I want to really also stressed on the fact that it was critical uh, not only for Rwanda, but our region, the East African region, uh, to, to sort of harmonize um, the response to COVID-19 and make sure that we can facilitate the movement of goods um, and, and, and uh, you know, the, 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 transport, um, the transport sector be supported so that we don't have any interruption in movement of goods, even though most of our partner states in the East African community had put, on, uh, have put in place uh, lockdown. This has uh, sort of worked well, which has also, you know, uh, I think stressed uh, the importance of cooperation, be it regionally and continentally, uh, to make sure that the essential goods can move uh, freely through countries, be it, uh, you know, uh, food and also pharmaceuticals and medical equipments. Um, as far as the uh, impact on the industry, we had really seen, um, you know, a growth in our industrial uh, sector, uh, where be it construction or, or, or manufacturing, uh, where we're growing at double digits uh, since 2017. Uh, last year, uh, the construction sector grew by 36%, industrial sector by 16%, uh, 
um, and 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 this is really um, you know one of the sectors that were, were um, contributing to to the growth that we've seen in Rwanda, um, and and. Uh, the fact that we've been able to harmonize with our uh, neighboring countries, uh, you know, the, the um, COVID-19 response and all the measures at the borders, this had somewhat mitigated, um, uh, you know, the, the, the risk that our industries are facing. Um, it has also, um, you know, forced us to, to repurpose, especially the textile and garment industries into the manufacturing of, of, of uh, personal protective equipment being barrier marks, coveralls, and through technology as well, we have some companies now developing uh, face shields and, 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 and ventilators that are locally made. Uh, so we see, of course, that there are disruption in our industrial sector, but there are also potential that we're trying as a government to also support through our recovery plan. Okay, if I can follow up quickly, originally you were kind of pegged for growth of what, nearly 8% in 2020, and there's still some hope you can grow 2%. Is that realistic or is that a recovery number for 2021 in Rwanda, would you say, Surya? So the, uh, the, the um, projections for this year still give us a growth of 2%, but mm. uh, this has to be seen. Although we see a growth of 2%, we've had an average growth uh, of 7% in the last 15 years. And we hope mm -hmm. to see a recovery in 2021 with a projected growth by, by the World Bank at 6%. Uh, but this, this means that we really have to make sure that one, as we protect our, our health systems and put in place the COVID-19 um, protective measures that our economy is not hit uh, that much as well. Okay, if I can follow up, Mr. Rakovich. Um, a contraction for Russia, which is a pretty stable economy, as you know, we've seen the pressure on oil and gas prices uh, with oil hovering in this range of 40 to $45 uh, a barrel. It's not fantastic, but your budget is break even around the same level. Uh, what influence is this going to continue to have on growth? And is there a counter strategy not to be overly dependent on the gas exports to Europe and, and the oil uh, exports in particular to China worldwide? Right. Uh, the effect of lower uh, oil and gas and overall commodity prices on the Russian economy is quite big, uh, though, it, uh, though not 100% uh, uh, of the decline uh, can be explained just by oil and gas. The expected uh, decline this year is about, and it's quite realistic. Uh, uh, I would say uh, two or three percentage points uh, after, uh, out related to the decline and uh, lower prices. The rest uh, is the overall effect of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, on the economy, uh, and uh, uh, we could uh, have a uh, deeper uh, decline without the verification in the last few years, especially in agricultural sector that uh, needs to grow uh, quite steadily, uh, and we have already quite large uh, grain exports uh, from uh, Russia to the rest of the world. Uh, but still, the verification is a priority, uh, and uh, we uh, very much future will come from uh, manufacturing uh, and uh, uh, and with the continuous growth of agriculture uh, as well. And innovation is a big part of that. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we believe that Russia can take uh, a good niche uh, uh, in the global economy, bringing innovation forward. Great. Let me pose the next question to Minister Humuyan of uh, uh, Bangladesh. How long will the uh, change last because of COVID-19 on consumer habits, uh, Minister, and, and also travel? And how does that influence the thinking of your budgets in Bangladesh, the industrial strategy, the drive for innovation? Do you think this is going to last more than uh, 18 months to two years in, in the psyche and the wheels of commerce around the world, Minister? Thank you, John. You have asked a very important question. So, especially in Bangladesh, we have already taken very serious notes and our government is working on this, we think definitely the impact of this COVID-19 will continue and we have to fight out it along the way. There's no certain time period, but what the loss we have incurred, we have to cover it up. And we have to cover up, the government has taken so many packages and so many steps. So with financial assistance to the these manufacturers and other 
supply chain to continue everything. So we are very hopeful and we are recovering very quickly. Our economy has taken very good time. So our earlier the development process and everything to continue, especially the IMF has already predicted on our activity that according to IMF prediction, this year Bangladesh will have 60% growth, the highest in South Asia. So it's very helpful for us and we are working on this direction. So we have taken so many steps, it will take time to explain all these things. Yes, sir. We will send our governments this plan, long term and short term, both plans we have taken to face of this thing. Especially, I am optimistic, but I have to be realistic also mm -hmm. at the same time. A UNIDO study conducted between June 10 to July 25 to 20 showed that recovery from the impact of COVID-19 will take more than six months. I fully agree with you. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. If I can follow up with you, Minister, and then I'll pose the question to our uh, minister joining us from Rwanda. But let me go back to Bangladesh here. Who do you see as your future trading partners for Bangladesh? I know ASEAN is a very large block for you in Southeast Asia. I know there's been interest from the Middle East countries of investing in Bangladesh. It's a very large large consumer market on its own. Uh, where do you see your future now? Does COVID-19 force a rethink on your new uh, strategic partners uh, for foreign direct investment, Minister? Especially our Asian nations, Asian countries, uh, Japan and other countries are working. Future, all will work together because somebody relocating is started in our year. So other countries from especially the Asian countries who are working together with Japan and leading Japan with other countries. That's why we know that very within a short time we can cover up. The target we have taken, we can fulfill. And our supply chain will continue smoothly mm. and we can re reach our achieved goal very short time. What we will do. That's our decision. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Minister Soraya of Rwanda, you know, it's been extraordinary watching the FDI numbers going back to uh, 2000 of just $8 million in foreign direct investment in the country uh, to the latest figures that we've seen in 2018, which I'm sure went up in the last two years, but we're looking at a level of over $300 million. What influence does this process now because of the global shop of the pandemic have on foreign direct investment? And then the tighter integration of East Africa and the obvious partners with Rwanda as a hub, but reaching into some of the larger economies in your region like Ethiopia. Um, thank you very much. As far as, as investments are concerned, it's true that the, the, the last two years we really saw um, FTIs continue to flow in, especially in, in uh, uh, technology linked uh, sectors. I would give an example of the first um, uh, mobile phone or smartphones uh, assembly in, in, in Africa with Mara phones that set up shop in Rwanda. We could also attract in the um, automobile sector the first assembly of, of Volkswagen uh, last year in the last two years alone. Um, mm. and, and we also were targeting as, as investments uh, really the pharmaceuticals, which I think is, is a timely sort of uh, investment attraction. We have two uh, companies that are now starting operation being Apex Biotech and Leaf Pharmaceuticals um, to, to sort of have our local uh, manufacturing capacity in pharmaceuticals as well um, as, as we continue to, to really invest heavily in the three priority sectors that we want it to be, uh, I would say, self-sufficient uh, in agro-processing, um, light manufacturing, um, and also construction materials. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the construction industry being one of the fastest growing, we wanted to make sure that we also use um, uh, locally made uh, materials, building materials. Um, mm. uh, and, 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 and this pandemic, of course, um, you know, the, the challenges that it poses are, are still evolving, but I think it's also a potential, not only for Rwanda, but also 
for our continent as a whole to address uh, the supply chain um, challenges and known tariff barriers that we've been encountering. And in that regard, you know, the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which was signed two years ago in Kigali, uh, was supposed to enter into force, start uh, entering into force in July this year, but has been pushed back uh, to start in, 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 in January 2021. This is, I think, a formidable uh, opportunity for our continent, not only to boost intra-African trade, um, but also make sure that we really capitalize on uh, the potential for increased production uh, continentally and make sure that we can also link our markets uh, because we've, we've been trading mostly with, with um, external partners, I would say, beyond our continent, but by focusing on value addition on the continent and increasing um, you know, trade among our countries. This is a 1.3 billion market that we have here, uh, which we will be able to, 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 to sort of have uh, a single market. And there's a potential to have it, but also it, under, uh, it, it, it means that uh, it, every country in Africa has to put all the efforts in not only, um, you know, uh, investing in infrastructures, uh, setting up uh, special economic zones and industrial parks, which is a heavy uh, investment from governments, but that's, you know, a long term also investment that we see uh, will be sort of a game changer. And it means also on the FDI side, we are really positioning ourselves as a, as, as, a, as a hub for the East African region, but Central African region as well. And, and, and um, you know, one of, 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 of our investment has been in our um, national airline uh, linking uh, Kigali, our capital, to uh, now more than 20 destinations in Africa, but also starting also, uh, you know, through Rwanda to fly to, to Asia, to China and India specifically, and also opening up flights to Europe, Brussels and London uh, in the last two years, which also has helped us, especially when all the land borders were closed to continue into, uh, you know, using Rwanda as, 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 as cargo for our exports, but also imports uh, from, from the markets that, that are important to us. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe bring, uh, let me bring back Mr. Barkovich from uh, Russia. Uh, there seems to be quite a trend here when there's such a shock from something like COVID-19 uh, that the major countries of the world start to cocoon, if you will. So we've seen the tensions between the US and China, for example. Uh, what's Russia's position on this and making sure that the, the agreement you have in the region there, for example, with Central Asia, your partnership with China, the inroads you've made with India and Europe, they, they don't get thrown away because uh, of cocooning, if you will, or protectionist tendencies during a crisis. Mr. Prokovich? Yeah, uh, the appearance of uh, uh, economic islands, uh, I would say, is a very dangerous trend that uh, we uh, see now all over the world, actually. And to some extent, it's emotional reaction uh, on what um, uh, happening uh, in, uh, in the global economy. And uh, uh, many governments have been frightened uh, by the risk of just not getting uh, the right goods and services uh, uh, in time uh, that could damage uh, the local economies. Uh, so uh, more and more localization um, uh, is uh, going on all, all around, including in Russia. Uh, but uh, what we are trying to do is to find out what are the critical things to uh, produce in Russia, rather than uh, turning the whole economy into just one island. Uh, and uh, we uh, have, uh, have been always uh, stating, and we remain in this position, that uh, uh, we uh, are ready to be as open uh, as other countries uh, want to be open. Uh, so uh, we cannot just uh, um, keep our eyes uh, closed uh, on uh, on the protectionist measures that other economies are taking, including against Russia, including uh, by sanctioning uh, uh, Russia sometimes. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, certainly there is no intention to close the economy, and uh, we will always uh, will be always in favor of uh, more open economies since it will benefit Russia actually. Uh, we have a huge export potential, uh, and uh, if we will uh, close our markets for other countries, then other, other countries will do the same uh, towards our products. Uh, so uh, that could be uh, damaging as well. Okay, a, a follow-up for you. You had almost a million confirmed cases in the country, and it was quite a shock initially. What have we learned about the operations of government 
uh, the medical sector, uh, the resilience of manufacturing, the resilience of the Russian people during this crisis, and what does it mean uh, after COVID-19, in your view, uh, the strategic well, nature of what you learned to the system? Well, first of all, uh, we will uh, uh, learn all the lessons only after uh, it will be over, uh, but it is clear that uh, our health system uh, was able to manage uh, the, uh, the crisis. Uh, the Russian government took a careful approach, uh, uh, not uh, allowing for, uh, for uh, the uh, disease to uh, develop uh, very rapidly, not to overburden hospitals uh, and the health system in general. So uh, we never had um, uh, the crisis uh, in the uh, health system in any of the locations, I would say. Uh, still, uh, most of the hospitals are uh, like operating two thirds or three quarters of the capacity in terms of um, uh, treating uh, uh, COVID-19. So we have reserves uh, in the system that can uh, be used uh, if the crisis uh, will, uh, will uh, uh, go sharper. Uh, but uh, uh, it's pretty stable. And also, as compared to March or April, uh, doctors now uh, know how to treat the disease. Uh, so the uh, uh, mortality was not, uh, not high. It was relatively low as compared to other countries uh, as well. And uh, we are proud of our uh, doctors, of our health system. They, they are the heroes, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, what we found as well is that uh, given the structure of our economy, it it is uh, relatively easy to mobilize resources and start producing things that are really needed in, in such a crisis, including medicines, including uh, uh, protection uh, equipment, medical equipment, uh, cleaning uh, uh, substances, uh, disinfection uh, substances, uh, and uh, all, uh, all other things needed uh, uh, to fight the disease. Uh, so our uh, companies, our regions uh, were very... Uh, I, I, think I would say responsive to the requests uh, from, uh, from the government, from the health uh, system, and started producing things that are really needed very quickly. Sorry, let me bring in the Minister of um, Bangladesh one more time and look at, uh, you talked about innovation in Russia. How about innovation in Bangladesh and the fourth industrial revolution in Bangladesh? You have a very sophisticated manufacturing uh, sector, Minister. Uh, as a result of the crisis and then looking forward, what are the key major steps when it comes to manufacturing and innovation in, in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Bangladesh has taken step, especially in regard of fourth industrial revolution is a much discussed issue now. Within our country, too, our vision 2021, largely stressed on the application of digital technologies and transformation of our nation into digital Bangladesh. There are ample of opportunities to introduce the four industrial revolution technologies in the manufacturing field, and some pilot endeavors have already been successful in our country. As a populous country like ours, the manufacturing sector is highly labor intensive. The sector is playing a crucial role in large-scale employment generation and poverty elevation in the country. R&D and high-tech services and thus it calls upon a highly skilled tech force, task force, what is opposed to large-scale employment for the unskilled and semi-skilled masses. For a country like Bangladesh, where 2 million people are entering in the job market every year, poverty elevation is the major challenge and a substantial amount of low-income people are directly engaged in the low-skilled manufacturing jobs. Policy measures should be taken with extreme caution. To realize the dream of digital Bangladesh, we are preparing it to embrace the benefits of four IR technologies, keeping in fine balance between modernization and job creation for the masses. Thank you. Thank you.
if I can bring in uh, Minister Haku Zia Remye from uh, Rwanda again. Uh, I, I've had a chance to interview uh, President Kagame here in the UAE at the Dubai World Government Summit, and he often used this term of being the Singapore uh, of Africa, kind of similar in size in terms of population and then the surrounding markets around you. Uh, what's the next stage, would you suggest, Minister, when it comes to uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, defining it as the fourth? Does it come in rapid succession? Uh, does it actually happen in uh, Central and East Africa uh, at the aspirations that Rwanda has? Um, thank you. I, I think as, uh, you know, Rwanda had uh, already, uh, through our Vision 2020, um, you know, um, started and, 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 and implemented, um, you know, the strategy to, to um, not, not only heavily invest in, in information and communication technology, uh, building the infrastructure uh, through the fiber optic all across the country, but also, um, also uh, tapping into uh, especially our young, uh, our young people and giving them, you know, the, the education and skills needed uh, to develop not only, uh, you know, a platform that can be used uh, locally, but also integrate technology from education to all our sectors of, of, our, of our economy, being in agriculture, uh, of course, manufacturing and, and services. Um, and going forward, we have now launched what we call the Vision 2050, uh, which aims at transforming Rwanda into a high income country in the next 30 years. Um, and of course, Singapore is one of the models that uh, uh, you know, we look up to in terms of how they've been able to also develop fast and become uh, um, you know, a high income country in, in less than 50 years. Um, and it, it all starts really by, by investing heavily in our people, uh, giving them skills, but also in the health of our people where we see that the investments that were done in our health system uh, and working through community bells health system has also helped in, in, in also fighting uh, the COVID-19. Um, you know, we, we were uh, one of the, the first countries in Africa uh, to impose, uh, even though it was a strict a lockdown and, and prevent, and, and so far we have less than 20 deaths due to the pandemic, uh, which is something that we, we're really proud of, although we know we have to stay vigilant. And mm -hmm. second, it's already introduced technology also in the fight um, uh, against COVID-19 by introducing robots in our treatment centers um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and having really each time the latest technology and, and uh, uh, sort of integrated in all sectors of the economy. And now uh, more and more we see that even in our trade, we have to uh, make sure that we fast track uh, the strategies we had put in place into supporting um, our digital economy, um, e-commerce, and so forth, and 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 having that foundation of of, of a skilled labor force uh, that has access to technology that has been also uh, educated and 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 and. Um, trained uh, into, into developing, be it software, the use of technology. Um, and, and I think the biggest challenge is now how we translate that technology into also our manufacturing sector, which is really nascent, uh, but make sure that our uh, industries, our factories have access to the latest technology and we have uh, the National uh, Industrial Research and Development Agency that actually helps uh, specific value chains into uh, upgrading their technology. We started with agro-processing and textile last year and now we're working with, with the wood and we, we have to sort of quickly adapt on what are the needs now uh, being in medical equipments and as I mentioned into, into the, the protective equipment equipments as well. Uh, this is a fast, uh, I mean, not moving world, but I think the fact that, uh, you know, our, uh, our president, His Excellency, uh, President Paul Kagame already had set the vision on, we have to be a, a technologically advanced economy. We have to equip our people with, uh, you know, the, the, the education that they need so that they develop solutions that are adapted to our own context. And third, uh, working really for the integration regionally through the East African community, but also 
you know, the, the, the central, the economic uh, Central African community, which Rwanda is part of, and, and being at the forefront of, of the, the, the continental free trade area agreement, these are really fundamentals that we want to uh, help our economy grow further. Okay, I would like to wrap up uh, our session looking at uh, kind of the gender differences because of the crisis we've been through uh, right now. I, I know it's the case in, in Russia, Bangladesh, and Rwanda that there's no shortage of uh, competent female ministers. One has joined us today uh, in the cabinet, but uh, can we have a gender boost as a result of COVID-19, open up the workforce in a much more pervasive way uh, in all economies around the world? Let's start with Mr. Berkovich. Uh, in Russia. What's the influence as a result of this, do you think? <laughs> well, first of all, we, we just don't know what will happen with the structure of the, uh, of the workforce uh, altogether uh, after the crisis. Uh, how many people will work in the offices and uh, factories? How many uh, work from home? Uh, opinion poll shows that uh, maybe 20-25% of people will not return to uh, their uh, offices uh, after the crisis. Uh, and uh, uh, it will certainly affect the gender structure as well, uh, since uh, uh, working from home, uh, in some cases, it's just easier for, uh, for, uh, for the ladies uh, who have some uh, workload as well uh, being, uh, being at home uh, with all the respons responsibilities, uh, of course, uh, they have, unfortunately. Uh, the men uh, are sometimes not prepared uh, to do the same, and uh, <laughs> I know this by um, also thinking about myself. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, I think that clearly we have, uh, uh, we have to uh, do more to uh, give uh, better access uh, to women uh, all around uh, to higher positions. Uh, uh, also, it uh, uh, should concern the, uh, uh, the level of pay, since uh, uh, there is inequality uh, in this regard uh, as well. Uh, my second uh, job actually now is um, uh, being the president of International Chess Federation, uh, and uh, uh, we even established a certain minimum um, uh, regarding how, how many ladies should be in the top management and also servicing the top tournaments, uh, and we are on the right track. So uh, we know that this is uh, a right agenda to do, and um, I think uh, we will have a change. It, it's not going to be revolutionary. Uh, it's going to be uh, step by step, uh, unfortunately, uh, but, uh, but it, uh, it will happen. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Borkovich. Uh, Minister Humuyan, uh, I, we have uh, a female prime minister in, in uh, Bangladesh. So this, we're not uh, uh, gender shy in Bangladesh, but what are the efforts here for employment to unleash the growth in Bangladesh, whether it's in the informal sector or the formal sector? What's being done uh, with gender equality? equality in Bangladesh. Thank you, Mr. John, you know, especially in Bangladesh, our, the government, the head of the government and speaker and head of the opposition, we have all position with the woman. And one thing, you know, it, our constitution, the father of the nation, the after independence, our first constitution was when it was written, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Rahman, the then Prime Minister, he well explained and the specially equality of opportunity to women. Our constitution has granted their equal participation. As in our constitution, Article 19 of Bangladesh Constitution, stipulate 30, Public three, the state shall endeavor to ensure equality of opportunity and participation of women in all spheres of national life. Since then, our government has pursued this constitutional dictum in many forms. As a result, the World Economic Forum ranked Bangladesh first in gender equality among South Asian nations for the second consecutive year. So I will finish stating that example of our COVID responses in the COVID-19 stimulus packages, our government made a special provision that 50% of all loans must be provided to women entrepreneurs. Bangladesh is also globally applauded for the growing participation of women at highest political sphere. That's, thank you very much. Thank you for the clarity on that, uh, Minister. And if I can bring in uh, our Minister from Rwanda again, and you're working in trade and industry and the ability of formalizing the economy has always been a priority of President Kagame. 
How does this work, uh, would you suggest, uh, Minister Soraya, when it comes to gender balance in the country and making sure that you do unleash that growth uh, with women uh, participating at a greater level? Um, thank you, John. I think, um, uh, first of all, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the path that Rwanda has taken in, in um, you know, women empowerment and, and, and gender equity um, is already visible in the efforts that we have made to include more and more women into decision-making positions, uh, starting with, with the political space. Um, as you know, our, our, our parliament uh, has 63% has of women and now in cabinet since two years, we have uh, parity and, and this year we already at 52% of women in cabinet. Uh, and, and, and that success, um, and, and I think it's highlight sometimes people may, uh, you know, uh, be a bit skeptical saying it's not only about, uh, about, um, about numbers, but, but the quality, the competence of, of the women that are appointed. But I think as, as, uh, as many people know, um, uh, His Excellency President Paul Kagame is about competence. So it's not only the uh, the, the, the numbers that matter, but also the competence and also the ability to deliver on the job. We haven't seen yet uh, the same success in the business sector or private sector, which is, uh, you know, uh, where we're putting more efforts to also see more women, uh, not only leading large corporations, but also being uh, included in entrepreneurship. Um, we see more women actually in, in, in starting micro and small companies um, almost at 50%, but they are mostly also present in the informal sector, which means during the crisis, these are also the, the, the companies that, that were hit most and we're making sure that as, as we, 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 we extend, expand the, the recovery fund to companies, we also take into account uh, that gender perspective as well. But uh, ultimately we believe that the country's ability to really bounce back uh, from this crisis, crisis will be dependent on how inclusive uh, the new policies are, the new strategies for recoveries are. And, 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 and I'm happy to note that even our development partners, uh, we've worked uh, with, with UNDP, with, with uh, the trademark East Africa, which, which are um, organizations that are, are, are working with our government to especially, um, you know, uh, make sure that we can support uh, especially women uh, being in trade and, and in the business sector uh, to, to also weather the storm and, and um, you know, and we also had a partnership uh, with, with the civil society and the MasterCard Foundation, uh, you know, rapidly providing grants to, to micro and small enterprises, which, as I said, are in majority owned by women. Uh, and we will really be being very vigilant that the impact of the, the pandemic uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, doesn't, you know, translate into uh, women being left behind as far as uh, economic recovery is concerned. Great. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much, all three of you, for joining us today on this uh, very fascinating roundtable. Mr. Arkady Vorkovich is the chairman of the Skokable Foundation, very active in the energy sector in Russia for years as deputy prime minister. His Excellency Nurul Majid uh, Mahmoud Bumoyan, uh, who is the Minister of Industries in Bangladesh, looking at the manufacturing sector and all very facets of the uh, Bangladesh economy. Uh, and Her Excellency Soraya um, Haku Saramayi, uh, the uh, Minister of Trade and Industry from Republic of Rwanda, speaking on behalf of His Excellency Paul Kagame of Rwanda. Thanks for joining us.